on the second edition of the Euro Crash, um, I was looking through some historical cartoons and I came across one of Jacques Fussel, um, who was the, editor, the cartoonist for many years in the Figaro, and many of his cartoons are on top to go. And one of them caught my attention in 1963 when we had the French-German treaty, in which he portrayed de Gaulle and Adenauer together sitting at a table. I think de Gaulle at the time was in his late 70s and Adenauer in his 80s. And de Gaulle was saying to Adenauer, um, hurry up, where neither of us are eternal. Um, and Adenauer was hesitating signing the, the French-German treaty. But what it made me think was if only at that time, in 1963, France and Germany had decided to have monetary union, how much simpler it would have been than everything that's followed. At that time, monetary union would have been within a global dollar standard, essentially Bretton Woods one could view as a global dollar standard. There would have been no need to have an independent European Central Bank. After all, France and Germany together would have their job of the monetary authorities would have been to run monetary conditions such as to keep the... Um, Franco-German currency at its parity against the dollar. And in fact, um, if the objective of monetary union is to have peace in Europe, you only need monetary union between France and Germany, the rest is superfluous. Um, in fact, monetary union does not require a central bank, independent central bank, it doesn't require fiscal union, it doesn't require a fiscal transfer union, and it doesn't require political union. All of that is complete fiction. What it does require if we're not to have any of these, is an opt-out clause or a, an exit, exit provision. And um, indeed, if you look at monetary union in the 19th century and 20th century in the form of Latin monetary union, you did have monetary union with none of these um, between a whole range of European countries. And from time to time, one of them would leave and one would come in if, if they no longer could stay in. There was no question of bailouts or anything else, but that was a monetary union. And the monetary base for that system was determined by the automatic rules of the gold standard. Um, it was a flaw of the German <coughs> negotiators at Maastricht not to realize this key truth, that you can have monetary union with, without all the rest. And when Mitterrand and Co. held hands at the Verdun Cemetery, setting the train running towards European monetary union, there was no inevitability at all that the destination, destination had to be Maastricht with all its flaws. I, I, I would argue that the German government totally failed in safeguarding its citizens, and so did the Bundesbank, against all that was to follow. The train could have run to a union based on monetarist principle, as practiced by the old Bundesbank of Dr. Eminger and others. There would have been absolutely watertight rules against government financing, bailouts, lender of last resorts, banks lending to governments except with full appropriate equity risk-taking uh, in equity capitalization. And there would have absolutely been a provision for exits from EU. National currency denominations would have been retained so that exit could take place without a whole complicated procedure. The, the guiding principle for um, monetary manage or not monetary management, but monetary um, organization would have been monetary stability. And I'm going to say a few words about what monetary stability means, because monetary stability certainly does not mean inflation targeting, and it doesn't mean price level stability over short periods of time. Monetary stability, in the sense of J.S. Mill, or later as developed by the Austrian economists, or, means, has two dimensions. First, the monkey wrench, J.S. Mill's monkey wrench, mustn't... Of, 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 of a monetary monkey wrench mustn't get into the machinery of the rest of the econo economy and create um, goods and services inflation or asset price inflation. Um, asset price inflation is a very important concept in this and uh, I think in modern terms asset, you, would, you would interpret asset price inflation as meaning irrational exuberance in, 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 in a whole range of markets, credit and real estate <coughs> induced by um, money having got out of control. Um, so that's one aspect of monetary stability, um, absence of asset price inflation, absence of, absence of goods and prices inflation. The, the second aspect of monetary stability is um, price level stability over the very long run. That does not mean price level stability over two or three years. In fact, um, in a well-functioning monetary, stable monetary system, you should have a fluctuating price level. 
Because what, what has gone by the way in modern discussions is the realization that the way economies used to get out of slumps or recessions under, uh, period, under monetary stability, under a gold standard, was you had period, you, during a, a recession prices came down, there was an expectation that the price level would go back up again when prosperity returned. So the expectation for price level coming back actually meant that low nominal interest rates were negative in real terms. You didn't need Bernanke going out and inducing high inflation and inflation expectations to produce negative interest rates. The price level movements themselves induced these negative interest rate expectations. And that didn't involve all the drama and instability of what we have today under Bernankeism and, 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 and inflation targeting. Um, fatally for monetary union, Professor Issing, who the German government installed as the eminence grease of the ECB, completely failed to pursue this stable money route. Without ever admitting it, he was in fact an inflation targeter and an anti-monetarist. And you might have guessed that from his history in the Bundesbank, if you actually go back and look at the history <coughs> of Dr. Issing in the late Bundesbank years of the 1990s, he was perpetually giving in to the banking lobby to reduce reserve requirements and do away with, with um, basically monetary bases for target of, 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 as the pivot of the system um, against a whole lot of grassroots objections um, from the old uh, Bundesbank members of the board. Um, the monetary framework as designed by the ISN committee, which basically put the monetary framework in place in, in the few months before the ECB opened its doors, would have been abhorred by both Milton Friedman and Hayek, all be for different reasons. The money pillar, which Dr. Issing kept going on about, you could actually see it in some of his architectural sketches, but it was never translated into reality. And so the ECB, together with the Federal Reserve, created the greatest global monetary disorder in the world economy that we've seen since the 1920s, um, culminating in the global credit bubble and bust. ECB policy during the um, uh, years of the, of the 2000s and late 1990s was actually completely indistinguishable from the policy of the Ber Ber Bernanke Greenspan Federal Reserves. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's one of the paradoxes of European Monetary Union that under the old Bundesbank order, we actually had in Europe a, dis a very distinct, distinct monetary philosophy and monetary policy being run by the Bundesbank quite separate from all the inflation um, and asset price inflation and goods inflation that was being produced, first of all, by the Martin Fed in the late 1960s and then through the Arthur Burns period in the 1970s. The ECB actually, st the, sorry, the Bundesbank steered a completely different direction for Europe. Um, far from ECB and monetary union in Europe becoming the engine of European stability, it became the engine of Europe monetary st instability in conjunction with the US. It failed to produce any sort of island of stability or zone of stability in Europe from the United States. It did exactly the opposite. So what we had was all the same um, <coughs> errors in Europe as in the United States, deflation phobia, I mean, remember the 2003 conference when Issing promised that de inflation should never go below 2%, and it was, just so seri it was as serious for it to go below 2% as above 2%. Um, all the talk about Japan deflation, avoiding Japan deflation. One, one thing that Bundesbankers and, sorry, the ECB officials and Federal Reserve officials don't seem to realize is that we've never actually had deflation in Japan. If you look at the price level today in Japan compared to where it was in 1990, it's the same. We've actually had golden price level stability in Japan. You've had some periods of price level fallings and some periods of price level rising, but that's absolutely normal under, under, uh, under a system of pro under, under the ideal situation of long term price level stability. Um, inflation targeting you had in the ECB in the same way as in, um, as, as in, 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 in um, US. And of course, during a period of rapid productivity growth, when the, as we had in, after the IT revolution in the, in the period of, of the 2000s, and rapidly falling import prices from China and what have you, the natural state of affairs during that period should have been price levels falling. So there should have been some good deflation, instead of which ECB was aiming for this 2% inflation target in the same way as the Fed. And surprise, surprise, we induced a, a massive asset price inflation. Now, the asset price and credit bubble inflation in Europe um, has to really be seen in conjunction with what was happening in the US. I mean, we're a global village, but the, 
just as in the US we had the secondary um, mortgage crisis and subprime mortgage and private equity bubble. In, in Europe, the credit bubble took the form of um, loans in, in um, uh, mortgage explosion and real estate explosions in, in some of the countries like Spain in particular. And um, another, aspe another aspect of the credit bubble in Europe was the sovereign debt bubble. You really have to look upon the fact that banks were go and investors were, were, um, were go going into um, Greek bonds at 50 basis points above Germany in the middle part of the decade as a, as a feature of a credit bubble. There was a complete lack of rationality, which was explained by the underlying irrational exuberance which was being created by this monetary instability. Um, we, we then come on to the 2007 period when the bubble begins to burst. Um, what does the ECB do? It does exactly the same as the Federal Reserve. Instead of immediately bringing rates down to zero, which is what should have happened in late 2007, and allowed credit spreads to widen out and the banks to recapitalize themselves through great profit incentives, both the ECB and the Federal Reserve are so alarmed about inflation, which of course is a lagging indicator and oil prices rising, that they keep interest rates up at 5 or 6% way through till summer 2008 when, when their economies have already been in recession for, a, for almost getting on to a year. Um, now there is, a there is a critical difference between um, the situation of the ECB and its massive um, aid for banks um, and backstopping the banks through the, the liquidity operations and what the Federal Reserve does. The big, the big difference being that ECB, whenever it makes any loans at all, is acting as a transfer agent. It's actually taking it's making loans on the basis of German and other financially strong countries guaranteeing whatever it's doing and lending it out to a whole range of debtors um, outside Germany very largely. So that there's a, there's a transfer effect in, in its operations, which is not the same as with the um, ECB. Um, what you now have is, 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 as a result of the um, massive capital flight out of some of the peripheral zone countries is that the ECB is essentially filled up its balance sheet with massive loans against dodgy collateral to dodgy banks. Um, ECB is basically bust, um, but it keeps going because of the implicit guarantee of Germany and maybe a few other financially strong countries um, to recapitalize the ECB whenever that's required. Uh, if you did a back of an envelope, envelope type calculation today as to the real black hole in the ECB balance sheet and the other um, debts which Germany has actually taken on in some sense is eventually is having to pay. Um, I, would, I would say that the amount that Germany is, 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 is in mortgage for far exceeds anything that was ever realistically put forward for Germany to pay after the First World War in terms of, in terms of reparations. And that, that brings me on to where, where I see the real vulnerability of the present system is going forward going to be. At some point, Germany or German public opinion has to decide, do they continue to stand behind the ECB, re, um, make up all its um, black holes, all the black holes in the EFSF everywhere else, um, or do they walk away and um, allow the, the losses to be shared out between all the creditors? What I would suggest finally is that walking away, in the case of Germany, they're never going to be able to walk away without France coming quickly after them, in the sense that France has invested so much politically in the European Monetary Union, but if, if, if Germany ever actually said they were leaving, France would pretty well accept all the terms of Germany laid on the table. And um, it's a great pity that didn't happen back in May 2010 when Sarkozy threatened <coughs> the European Monetary Union if Germany didn't bail out Greece. If, if Germany at that point had said, OK, go, Sarkozy would have been back in five minutes agreeing to all Merkel's terms. But of course, Merkel didn't do that. She's, she's frau mouse and she, didn't, she, didn't, she made a fatal mistake in, in, not, in not, particularly, not playing that um, particular gambit. I think that gambit is going to be played in the future, um, and when it does, we could say that EMU 1 is dead, long live EMU 2, and I think the form of EMU 2 that, take place, that takes place will be a narrow monetary union between France and Germany. Um, it will be without all the bailouts. Any countries that get invited in will be on a strict condition that uh, they, 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 if problems come, they exit, there's no bailouts. And hopefully this new European Monetary Union of a much, much narrower form will be built on monetarism, not financialism. Brendan, thank you.